Uh, good morning, everyone, and can I welcome everyone to the 21st meeting in 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone uh, present to turn off mobile phones or other devices to silent mode so they don't disrupt uh, this morning's proceedings. Uh, we have not had any apologies uh, th this morning. Um, and we shall move to agenda item one, which is decision to take items in private. The committee is asked to agree that item seven, consideration of evidence, and item eight, pre-budget scrutiny, are taken in private. Is the committee agreed to that? Yes. Thank you. We move to agenda item two, subordinate legislation. The committee will take evidence on the relayed first tier tribunal for Scotland, social security, chamber and upper tribunal for Scotland composition regulations 2018 uh, in draft. This instrument is subject to the affirmative procedure. And can I welcome Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People, Naeem Batty, Head of Complaints, Redeterminations and Appeals Policy, and Colin Brown, Solicitor Scottish. I want to welcome all of you th this morning. Uh, and can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an open statement um, and then we'll move to questions after that, Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. Following my previous appearance of 4th October to discuss six out of the seven sets of regulations required for establishing the new chamber, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the final set of regulations. These were withdrawn and relayed to address a concern raised by the DP. Uh, uh, LRC. The Tribunal Composition Regulations will allow the Tribunal Service to have panels that best meet the needs of the particular case that it is considering. While the regulations set out the cases will normally be considered by a legal member sitting alone, there are a number of exceptions. So, for example, uh, employment injury cases, there will always be two members, a legal member and a medical member, whereas for disability assistance cases, there will always be three members, a legal member, a medical member and a member with disability experience. The regulations also provide flexibility to vary the composition of tribunal panels where needed. The main example is in the relation to the upper tribunal. It will allow the president of the Scottish tribunals to decide on a case-by-case -case basis what the most appropriate composition of the tribunal would be. This was highlighted as a key requirement during the consul consultation, consultation. The provision was also revised to address the concerns that were expressed when the regulations were initially laid on the 13th of September. I therefore move the motion in my name and would of course be happy to take questions from members. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Do we have any questions? Uh, Jeremy Balfour. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, thank you very much, and thank you for your introduction, which was very helpful. Can I just seek clarification in regard to Section 4 um, of the composition, and in particular, subsection 4, uh, and that is the, the authority to determine the composition of the first year tribunal will be made by the Chamber President. Um, I, I mean, I welcome the remarks that you make that first-tier tribunals, particularly DLA pit ones, will always have three members. I suppose my slight concern of reading these regulations as they are is that, and if I'm wrong, please do correct me, that in theory, the Chamber President could vary that to just have two members, and we may lose a disability component person from that. Um, is that a possibility? for maybe not now, because clearly it's not your intention, but for future administrations, or will the first tier tribunal always have three members where it's a PIP, DLA or attendance allowance case? So, as I said in my, my early part of my opening um, remarks, I discussed what would happen for a, a disability assessment tribunal. The flexibility is around what would happen f uh, to top up benefits, for example, and the reason that there is that flexibility is because we do not have any top up benefits um, at the moment to top up to reserve benefits. Therefore, um, it is difficult to uh, ass assess what exactly you would want, and it um, would be important not to be too prescriptive about that at that point. So that's where the flexibility uh, okay. lies, is, is for those types of benefits um, that we don't have yet. Yeah, and so just to be absolutely clear for the record, the, the, the tribunals that we have at the moment, there is no flexibility to alter the membership of those. They are, as you mentioned in your opening statement. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions from members? Okay. There being no other questions, we will move to the next item, which is Agenda item three uh, on the same topic, still support legislation, and can I invite Ms. Somerville to move the motion S5M14434 in your name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, 
Moved, convener. OK, so uh, the question is that the Social Security Committee recommends that the first tier Tribunal for Scotland, Social Security Chamber and Upper Tribunal for Scotland Composition Regulations 2018 be approved. Are we content to recommend this instrument for approval? We are. Thank you very much and thank you for joining us, Cabinet Secretary. Dear yeah. officials, we'll just suspend briefly. OK, welcome back, everyone. Uh, and we now move to agenda item four, uh, which is an inquiry in, in relation to social security and, and work poverty. Uh, agenda item four continues an inquiry into social security and work poverty and is the fourth evidence session. The focus this week is back to universal credit and in particular the role of the work coach. And can I welcome David Semple, PCS Chair of Scotland Committee, PCS Union. So uh, thank you for joining us, Mr Semple. Um, with your permission, we'll, we'll go straight to questions, if, if, if that's all right. Oh, nice. um, now, the, the, the PCS has a, has a very clear position in relation to, to, to universal credit. Um, now, our inquiry is with specific to, to in work poverty, there's a lot of wider issues in relation to that. It might be helpful um, if, if I read um, the PCS General Secretary, Mark Zerwatka's uh, comments on universal credit, which are pretty clear and strong. Universal credit remains a disaster because it is driven by the Tories' political choice to cut public spending and to denigrate people who rely on social security support. The misery in being inflicted by the government's mishandling of this disastrous programme must be stopped and the full rollout should be suspended immediately. Whilst I suspect, Mr Semple, I might share a lot of those, those beliefs, our inquiries in relation to in work poverty. So I would ask for your comments in relation to those pretty strong words from your General Secretary in relation to those in, in work poverty. So where is the disaster in relation to in work poverty? Where is the mishandling in relation to in work poverty to allow us to better interrogate um, the issues with our inquiry? Well, I mean, obviously, I would very strongly agree, and I think our members would very strongly agree with the sentiments espoused there by the General Secretary. In relation to in-work poverty, we see day and daily in universal credit and uh, the, the written submission that we have given to the committee uh, includes evidence from members in Dundee and the three benefit centres in Glasgow, which show their experience of dealing with very, very upset people who are unhappy with the handling of universal credit. That includes all elements of universal credit, including people who are in work. I mean, the, the number of um, particular areas for those who do work include the cuts that are coming down the line uh, once we see managed migration. Whatever is being said about transitional protection, we still feel that ultimately people will lose money through the move to universal credit from other in-work benefits, such as working tax credits. But also it's in terms of the potential for a conditionality regime. I worked in a job centre um, whenever the stricter benefit regime was brought in and the kinds of sentiments, the ideology that was directed towards work coaches, what they were then called personal advisors, to force them to try and treat their claimants like they were the enemy is something that we could very easily foresee being reintroduced once we begin to down the road towards introducing um, in-work claimants into job centres on a much grander basis than, than currently happens presently. So all of these are examples of ways in which people who are currently in work, who are currently in receipt of working tax credits or who might in the future be in receipt of um, universal credit, working tax credits components, would face detriments and would face problems as a result of how the system is currently set up. Okay, now one of the things um, our committee has explored in relation to this inquiry is what's coming down the line in relation to in work conditionality. So people out there just now who don't consider themselves part of the benefit system, they get some additional supports uh, to, to help them get by, uh, fam fam families doing good jobs out there, who will 
at some point in the future start to have conversations with their work coach about, well, couldn't you do some more hours? Couldn't you get a higher hourly rate? Don't you think you could take a second job? Those are very real questions that, job, that work coaches could be asking uh, families. And if the work coach doesn't get the answer they feel they need in relation to that, we're talking sanctions, effectively, for families who don't even think they're in a benefit system, never mind uh, anyone else. So um, how does a work how will a work coach know the local labour market to make a determination about whether there are ample jobs out there in, in, in the community? How would a work coach know transport links uh, about whether it's reasonable for an individual to get to a second job? How would the work coach know childcare options in an area in order to have them make effectively what is a professional value judgment on whether someone is trying who is in work is trying hard enough to get progression through their employment. So how can work coaches realistically do that? Well uh, the first thing I would say is that the current number of work coaches simply wouldn't be able to do that in any meaningful way. The number of claimants that you're talking about, the additional footfall into our job centres, which as you'll be aware have been cut in number over the last couple of years, it wouldn't be sustainable for work coaches to have meaningful conversations with people who are in work to be able to raise the kind of questions that you talk about. Now, I want to be absolutely clear that I trust the professionalism of my colleagues, my union members, that every single person that I know who works in a job centre desperately wants to help the people that they're talking to. It's about how the system is set up. It's about how those conversations are set up. It's about how those work coaches are trained. It's about what support is available in the local area. And we have to be very, very honest that there's not a huge amount of support that would be able to help a lot of these people. The randomised control trial, which I'm sure you have the results of, shows very clearly that there's no statistics Statistical, meaningful statistical difference in terms of dragging people in to subject them to work uh, to conversations in a job centre versus not doing that. So I think the answer is that they simply couldn't, and it's not down to the want of trying on their part to support their claimant base. It's down to very basic things like staffing. But there's also a sort of a much more structural element to this as well, which is. If you are telling someone that you should go and uh, find a, another job, find a, a higher paying job, increase your hours and so on, you have to be aware obviously of the, the impact that that has to that person's life. And th I think that there, there's a very, very, very great worry on our part that if we were to try and treat people who are in work the way that the government has in the past tried to treat people who are out of work, that that simply wouldn't happen. Could you say a little bit more uh, in relation to the workload coming down the line for work coaches then, because uh, I think we heard the average caseload at the moment, uh, well, pre-universal because it roll out anyway, was well under 100, but it's mm. anticipated to go to about 343 per work coach. So there are going to be additional demands on the time of work coaches, but we're going to see a huge increase in the amount of clients that, that they have. So. Uh, can you see a little bit more around that? Yeah, um, what I would be clear about is that the, the actual number of claimants is less important than what you're actually doing with them. So if, if you take the legacy benefit caseloads, no matter how many people you had in your caseload, that wouldn't necessarily determine how often you were bringing them into the job centre. There would be the basic fortnightly uh, regime signing on and things like that, things that many people will be familiar with. But we would also have had other regimes of bringing people in daily bringing people in weekly, having ad additional ad hoc appointments and so on. So the, the, the final number at the end of the page is less important than what regime you're actually subjecting people to. 343 on anything like the kind of regimes that we subject the unemployed to and those who are on a working age benefit for sickness and disability, we simply wouldn't be able to cope with the resources that we currently have available. Okay, now 340 is a projected number, yeah, that's uh, right. of course. I'm assuming, never assume I suppose, but, but I'm, I'm assuming that those 343 people will have to use their online journal as, as a matter of course. That would be nearly 350 separate online journal accounts for one individual work coach to monitor for any communications from 
from, from their client base. Is that feasible? We don't think so. And you, you touch on it there. The 343 applies to the work coach. The other side of things is the benefit processing side of things. And our case managers for universal credit in service centres are would, would also be looking at those journal entries that you refer to. Their case would be somewhere in excess of 900. And the kinds of concerns that they would be obliged to pick up would be in relation to payments, you know, whether a payment was correct and so on and so forth. And again, that's simply not manageable. Okay, final question for myself, then I know my colleagues want to come and explore this further. Earlier on, I was asking about, um, certainly it was a question of professionalism of, of, of work coaches, but we have to look at what they've been asked to do, the, the numbers of people they've been asked to work with, and the demands on their time. We also have to look at the, the training that we've put in place for them. So I was given the examples of having to know the the local and regional labour market pretty well, having to know transport links pretty well, having to know the childcare environment pretty well. And I could go on and list, list other things that would have to know pretty well. What training do work coaches get to allow them to uh, be aware of this? All of our work coaches get training. Uh, the to give you an example, since you mentioned transport links, you go into any job centre in Scotland and I'd be fairly confident that you'll find a fairly well annotated map of all the local transport links on the wall. You know, bearing in mind that a lot of the support that you're talking about, we have to deliver to people who are out of work anyway. Mm -hmm. So knowledge of the local labour market isn't necessarily the problem, although I would say that there has been a process of de-skilling work coaches from what they used to be. It used to be the case that we would have had dedicated teams in the job centres to go out and liaise on a very regular basis with local employers to provide the job centre with a list of vacancies that they could sub to you know, the, the people that we were dealing with. Lots of that has been reduced in scope or taken away entirely, and so that additional support isn't there. I'm confident that work coaches would have some knowledge of the uh, local labour market, they'd have, they'd have definite knowledge of the local transport links, but there are things behind the scenes that we used to be able to do for the people who are out of work that we can no longer do, and these are the kinds of supports that we would obviously be looking at exactly the same for people who are currently in work, who may be looking for other jobs and so forth. The, the more difficult aspect to it is the kind of the personal conversations that you referenced. Whenever you talk about you know, people who have families, people who have reasons that perhaps they have the situation they have and wouldn't be guaranteed of finding a boss in any other job which would support them in the way that a particular boss has and so forth. These kinds of questions are that they're far too open to interpretation and the, the question of whether and when to use the discretion that would potentially be at the fingertips of a work coach is a very, very difficult one. We don't think that the training is sufficient for that. And obviously, I mean, I, I presume that everybody has seen the SPICE um, bulletin, which actually gives you a link to the, the actual training modules for people who are in work for our work coaches. Um, and I have to say, I don't think anybody would argue that that is the be-all and end-all of the, the type of training that we would need. Okay, and finally, do bricks and mortar matter? So in my local community, uh, we lost Mary Hill Job Centre. Yes. Now, I, I have to uh, uh, make an apology, actually, because I should have been in that job centre more often than I was before it was threatened with closure. One of the things I found from my constituents is they built up really positive relationship with, a, with work coaches, and there was a much more positive dynamic uh, there than, than I anticipated yeah. there, there would be. But that job centre closing and, and, and uh, constituents going to Springburn or Partick or whatever seemed to break down a kind of a local skills and knowledge base and relationship base in a community when that job centre closed. Do, do, do job centre closures impact on the ability to have that positive relationship with uh, uh, those who are claiming benefits and, and work coaches in a community? To talk about the job centre closures is to open up a whole can of worms because we're talking about imposing additional costs on people to travel to and from job centres for appointments which, you know, although they uh, may be mandated by their work coach, they may or may not be told that can, they can get money, in, uh, money back from. So you're talking about uh, people who are already low-waged, currently in work, being told you must attend your job centre potentially on a fortnightly basis and so on. And bearing in mind that job centres, local job centres have been closed, the distances being travelled, the cost of that travel has now increased. But yes, you also touch on the other side of it, which is that local communities built up relationships with those job centres. The staff from Mary Hill moved from Mary Hill to my job centre, which is Springburn. And, you know, the, the, we, we obviously work together very well and they will bring all of their skills and so on to Springburn. Those skills most of the time won't be lost. Although, you know, in some cases we have had staff obviously forced to leave 
um, over the, the closure programme across the country. So we have lost skills and things like that. And it makes it more difficult to maintain relationships with local employers, for example, if you don't have a local job centre. And that's a problem, because if your job is to liaise with those employers, if your job is to, to make a, a judgement call about whether and when somebody can look for additional work, look to increase their hours and so on, then you need those relationships. OK, thank you. Uh, Deputy Kavira. Uh, good morning, um, David. I, I want to ask you about two areas, uh, just a quick one and a follow-on from Bob, which is about the work progression. But substantially, I want to ask you about the transfer of in-work benefits from HRC. But I'll start with the... I wondered if you would agree that not enough work has probably been done about this question of work progression. It's a phrase, but in reality, and I think you've described some of it, a work coach which I would accept is out to help the person sitting in front, could not possibly know all the combinations involved in transferring from one employer to another in order to get progression. And I, I just think it's one of the areas of work which is completely underestimated by the designers of the scheme. Um, but one area I wonder if you might agree that I think there's a kind of lack of understanding of employment rights in relation to progression of employment. Because one of the one of the reasons you wouldn't want to move from one employer to another, even although you might get higher pay, is you have to think about you lose all your employment rights. Do you think that's fair to say that? Yeah, very, very much so. I mean, as you rightly point out, I think it takes two years of employment for you to have okay. the right to go to an employment tribunal if you're mistreated in certain circumstances. So you would lose that by having to change employer. There's a, there's a huge problem with understanding of, of employment rights in this country, like, and I, I mean both Scotland as a country and the United Kingdom as a whole, where vast swathes of the economy don't have trade unions which can actually speak up and represent and defend workers. That's, that's a real problem. And you know, we are playing into a culture of attacking employment rights if we're telling people that in order to get benefit, they have to give up those rights to move to a different employer. Yes, you're absolutely right. Would you expect to get some guidance um, in the DWP handbook, if you like, on what would happen if, if, if someone said, well, I don't want to go for that job because I'm be concerned that they've got a bad reputation as an employer or I might lose my employment rights? Would you expect to get some, your members to get some advice about how to deal with that question? You phrased that quite interestingly. Would I expect them to get some guidance? I would want them to get some guidance. I wouldn't be able to comment beyond that. Right, fair enough. Um, can I switch to asking about the transfer of in-work benefits from HMRC to DWP? This strikes me as, again, an underestimate of what we're about to do here, which is to transfer wholesale all of the tax credit, child tax credit, from an HMRC, which, let's face it, has had its problems, if our constituents would bear that out. But that seems to me to be going to be overloading already creaking system. Um, I wonder if you could outline to the committee, firstly, um, anything you can tell us about the impact of the workload and the ability to try and make universal credit actually work. And secondly, do you think that people who are in receipt of these benefits are aware that they will now be accountable, if you like, or the relationships going to change from the HMRC to the DWP? The people who claim tax credits, I can't imagine. Uh, well, let me uh, draw attention to the remarks. I think it was of uh, Neil Cooling, or potentially it was Alex Sharma. I can't for life me remember yeah. which. On the 18th of October, when they appeared before the Work and Pension Select Committee in the UK House of Commons, and they talked about how people who claim tax credits don't even know that they're on a benefit. And you know, I would say that's absolutely true. They, they don't. Now, the scale of work that we're talking about, you're not just talking about moving work you know, almost head for head, member staff for member staff from HMRC to DWP, you're actually talking about fundamental changes that vastly increase the amount of work per claimant to the new system to universal credit. So, for example, whereas HMRC would have looked at earnings on, a, on an annual basis, we are now having to look at them on a monthly basis. The volume of work has gone up dramatically, and that's before we get to the question of conditionality. It's before we get to the question of, are we bringing these people into job centres? Are we having to phone them from the service centres on a regular basis? And then on top of that, you've also, as uh, Mr Doris pointed out, you've also got the, uh, the journals. You've got people who have to check what they're putting on their journals on a regular basis and whether they're using those. 
Just, I, I don't know if you'd have a view, but whether or not, that given all the problems we've got with universal credit and trying to make it work and the underfunding, that one of the things you could do is to try and get on with the job is to just leave those benefits where they are, which is with HMRC, because it's working perfectly well. Well, look, I mean, Maybe I think... Not perfectly, uh, but it's working well. Yeah, uh, yeah that, was, that was essentially what I was going to say. That the managed migration presents all kinds of problems, and we at this stage are not in favour of managed migration. We think that the universal credit rollout should be halted in all of its forms because there are too many problems now to consider to continue putting additional burden on, as you defined, a, an already creaking system. So, yes, we would say that that should be, at the very, very least, paused, um, if not actually halted altogether. Thank you. Alistair Allen. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on some of the um, some of what's been prepared around the digital first approach. And I'll say this carefully. I'm not making a luddite yeah. point here, but I'd be interested to know how realistic you think some of that is in terms of the way you're going to have to interact sometimes with with people who either don't have the facilities or the confidence <coughs> or perhaps even the internet connection to do some of that. How realistic is this rollout? Is it going to work? In short, no, uh, to, to be really blunt about it. The digital first, let's, let me try and explain it to you from the perspective of somebody who's been trying to negotiate with DWP as one of the lead negotiators for universal credit uh, within the, the PCS and DWP. The constant problem that we have are too many phone calls to the service centres. People rely on the contact via the telephone with the service centres. And the reason that they rely on that is because the digital service is not really fit for purpose and is not fit for everyone, certainly. It's not fit for people who have problems accessing the internet. It's not fit for people who have literacy difficulties and so forth. So those people obviously call the service centres. Now, the service centres aren't actually staffed for that because the system has been designed as a digital first system. It has been designed that people go online and make claims online and use the journal online and so forth. It's not been designed for the actual real um, needs of the claimants. So the, the digital model breaks down, if you like, at the first hurdle, where then we find that because there's not enough staff and phone calls are going unanswered, and I mean, I mean you're talking a huge volume of phone calls which are missed by the department because of the lack of staffing where things are let sit for long periods of time and therefore drive more phone calls as people call in to check up rather than use their journals because they have no confidence that the journals are being used. It means that the staff that we do have can't then use the digital channels to communicate with claimants, which again forces things back to, if you like, the analogue model. So if, if we don't have the staff regularly checking the journal entries, which we don't, then we, the people who are putting those things online are then thinking, well, I need to make contact via the phone. I need to walk into a job centre. So the digital model is currently very, very dysfunctional. And it's on the basis of how few staff that we have to actually implement it. It's on the basis also that we haven't fully taken into account the needs of claimants. Now, I think in my last um, appearance before the committee, I, I, I spoke about the, a paper that DWP themselves had produced in 2011, where they identified that claimants actually want to be able to communicate with DWP through all of the available channels. They want to be able to have a face-to-face -face conversation with someone. They want to be able to have a conversation over the phone. And yes, there are a proportion of them who want to communicate digitally. And that's why whenever we were working with the uh, ministers to, to try and build the, the new Scottish social security system, that multiplicity of channels was really central to what we were trying to do. But no, the, the digital system currently is not fit for purpose. It is dysfunctional very much. Well, it's certainly very concerned to hear that. And I wonder, you, you mentioned examples there of situations where you feel people who don't go through the digital route, people who phone in can have their calls unanswered. You, you mentioned a situation where there's not enough people there to deal with them. What typically is, is happening to these cases? Are, are they... How long are people waiting to get a meaningful response? Well, I mean, the answer is as long as a piece of string. You can get responses relatively quickly. You can be waiting for a very long period of time. I mean, the the, the, the problem is that the, I don't think the DWP accurately calculates what we would call failure demand, which is the calls that claimants would make whenever we don't um, do something that we should have done within the time scale that we should have done it in. So the, I, I can't give you a figure that would you know, conclusively prove that this is how long people are having to wait. What I can tell you is the experience of my members who take those calls. And 
the, I've been conducting car park meetings in Walsall and Wolverhampton Service Centre last week. And you know, for anybody who has a trade union background, car park meetings are really the first step towards industrial action. Members unanimously voted for industrial action because of the pressure that they're under with regard to the workloads. And a significant part of that pressure is the number of people who are phoning in who are bitterly unhappy with the service they have received from DWP. Thank you. Alison Johnson. Yes, um, thank you very much for the evidence you're sharing with us this morning. Um, I, I think, to be honest, the more I hear, the more <laughs> concerned I become. Um, In-work conditionality has never been tried anywhere in the world right. before. Um, so it must be a major challenge to find out what works, if indeed it does at all. Um, and in your submission, you say that one estimate suggests that to support in-work claimants through job centre networks, footfall across job centres would have to increase by 325,000 a week. Um, and that's at a time when we're losing staff and losing job centres. So I just wondered if you could give us a view on the level of investment, additional training and you know, other changes that would be required to properly support people. Well, to properly support people, I think that the, the current staffing demand from the PCS is for 20,000 additional staff, and we have literally just last week submitted an additional demand for 5,000 universal credit staff, not just in the job centres, but in the service centres alone, mm -hmm. bearing in mind that the current staffing on UC service centres is about 12,000. That's the scale of the increase that you're talking about to make this system workable. Now, on top of that, there's any, any number of things that we could suggest that would improve the system. The, 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 the figures show that DWP has lost somewhere in the region of 40,000 staff since uh, 2010. That, that's a massive, massive cut to the number of people who are there to support claimants. And for that reason, the amount of unclaimed benefit, for example, mm -hmm. has gone through the roof. So there's all kinds of additional ways that we can and should be supporting people if we had the staff to do it. But that, that 5,000 additional staff on 12,000 existing gives you an example of the scale of the increase that we'd be talking about. Now, in terms of job centres, the view of the union, the view of our members is very, very clear that there should be a job centre in every locality in the country. We have, for years, we have had a process of closing down job centres and retreating from communities that is not, we feel, sustainable. And if we are going to be having really meaningful conversations about supporting people back into work uh, and supporting people whilst they're in work, then we need to rebuild that job centre network. We need people to see the job centre as a face that they can just turn to when they need to, to come and take some advice, to come and get the support that they need. But that also means that we would be talking about a system which doesn't involve any kind of sanctions. Because the greatest barrier to trust between the people who access the benefit system and the people who deliver it is the fact that the people who access the benefit system are forever fearful that the people they're talking to are going to recommend that their benefit be taken off them. Yeah, uh -huh. so you're trying to develop a relationship and you've got this undercurrent of concern, um, if not fear. And I think the other thing, you know, sanctions and conditionality so far has been associated with not being in work. Um, yeah, so I think that's quite a shift for, for people who are receiving the benefits, but also it's quite a challenge for your staff. Um, I, I just wonder to what extent you feel that um, management and indeed ministers are listening because there seems to be such a huge gap in the number of staff required, in the number of job centres required. And I'm you know, very concerned, I suppose it's obvious, of course, that this will increase people not claiming. You know, are, are ministers listening? We don't feel that they are. And I think if you want evidence of that, that would exist in the transcript from Hansard of the 18th October uh, committee meeting that I referred to earlier, where it was put to uh, Neil Cooling, the Director General of Universal Credit, that the, the, the position that I outlined about the problem with phone calls uh, was really driving some service difficulties. Neil's answer was to provide statistics which show that the average length of a phone call to DWP is around seven minutes. I mean, the last figure that I had um, as a TU negotiator was seven minutes, 43 seconds, and that on average the number of calls individual members of staff are taking is somewhere in the region of, um, I think it was the highest estimate I've seen is about 60 a week. Um, but we don't feel that those figures are accurate. Whenever we reported those figures directly to our members in service centres, members openly laughed. That's how the, the, the derision with which they treated the statistics reported there. The, the, the pressure going on is just beyond belief, and nobody's listening. 
the Director General, we don't feel, was listening, and the, uh, the ministers certainly don't seem to be listening. Although, what I would say is that despite the fact that they're not listening and they're not cooperating in terms of getting us to the situation where we think the union and the, the members of the union, the staff of DWP, think we need to be, they've also paused or, or delayed at least managed migration. <clears throat> so they obviously recognise that something's going wrong somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And can I just ask a question on that on that um, managed migration? Um, you know, d what, what sort of level of preparation do you, what has been put in place for that managed migration? I think the silence there really says it all. Um, <laughs> not not a great deal. The the types of claimants that will be dealt with under managed migration, we are already, already dealing with small numbers of them. So things like some of the training for work coaches has begun to be put in place. But th th I think the reality is that until they know what they're going to do with a lot of these people who will be transferred across, they, they can't really make the kind of preparations that would be necessary. Now, the biggest debate at the minute is, will people be subject to light touch voluntary approaches or will they be subject to a conditionality regime that very much puts sanctions at the centre of it? And that will determine you know, what kind of preparations would be necessary. But the answer, I think, if I was to give it honestly on behalf of the members of my union, is not a great deal of preparation. Can I ask one very quick question, convener? Just, yeah, who, who's going to decide whether it is a light touch voluntary approach or a more robust approach? I presume that'll be the Secretary of State. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. and happy for people to ask more questions. I've got a lot of members wanting in. We're doing very well for time. People have been quite constrained in their questions. Just ask people to show a bit of patience that they're having to wait before they get in. Michelle Ballantyne. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, I want to follow up on a number of things that you have talked about so far. Um, so we'll pick up on that first one that, that um, Alison Johnson has just asked you around who makes the decisions. How much autonomy do you believe a work coach has in terms of their relationship with the, the claimant and the decision making on how often they need to see them, what kind of um, regime they put in place? I mean, when you say the Secretary of State makes that decision, clearly on the ground operationally, there's different things going on in different job centres. So how much autonomy do your members have when they're dealing with the claimant? I think the answer is it, it very much changes from place to place and from situation to situation. You, I don't know, you, you seem to um, reject the idea that the Secretary of State would make such a wide-ranging decision as would impact how many times in a given week that the claimants would come into the job centres. I'm not centers. rejecting it. I'm asking the question, how much autonomy do people have on the ground? The... Decisions are made at a, at, a, at a national level, at the, the governmental level, that do determine whether or not people have to come in weekly, for example. So that takes away flexibility when it comes to the work coaches. But yes, they have some flexibility at the minute in some circumstances, not in all circumstances. So, for example, there was a while there where somewhere in the region of a third of all claimant caseloads were being brought in every single day. That was the aspiration. And that was on the basis that at a central level, they had decided that this would be the best way to support people to really you know, give them that extra oomph to, to get back into work. Now, that, that very much removes any kind of flexibility that work coaches would have. It removes their ability to make a judgment about whether or not the barriers that people face to getting back into work. And we are, I mean, we, we have to be honest, at the minute, because the uh, in-work side of things is so new and there are so few people prior to managed migration really kicking off. Most of the evidence that we're working with is on the basis of the people who were out of work who would have been claimants to JSA, ESA or the UC versions of these two benefits. And so yes, flexibility does exist sometimes. It, it, has, it can and has been taken away on other occasions and you know, obviously I, I can't really just tell you in advance what will be the case for the people coming in from working tax credits. Right. And, and you talked about the caseloads, obviously, and the size of the caseloads. What percentage of somebody's caseload do you think they'll actually have routine contact with? Um, because obviously the vast majority of people, for example, on working tax credits or child credits, have no contact from, you know, other than the actual application. So do, do you perceive that's going to change? And, and what percentage do you believe the actual contact load is with the caseload? Again, that's a question that I'd, I'm not necessarily sure I can give you a, a clear and a definitive answer to. I, what I would say is that the, the, the intention seems to be from the ground level that that will change, that yes, there will be much more contact with those people and the, 
the evidence base that was sort of begun to be gathered with the randomised control trial that DWP ran for 15,000 claimants, you know, obviously that did involve bringing people in to job centres on occasion. It did involve uh, some people coming in fortnightly. It did involve some people coming in on mm -hmm. an eight-weekly basis and so on. So depending on the decisions, as I say, that are made nationally, that will have an impact on how often people are seen. But yes, potentially that will impact every single person who is being moved across to universal credit, and it will almost certainly impact every single person who makes a new claim to the UC uh, versions of WTC and CTC. Okay. Um, and, and Final question at this time. Hopefully, I can come in again if other things arise. Um, you talked about um, the changes and, and people's expectations and, and their perhaps fear of going in. Do you think then that actually, from the legacy benefits as they were, because you talked about the digital platform and how mm. restrictive it was, but my experience from working with my own clients before I became a politician, was that job centres were pretty unapproachable. You were met by a security guard at the door, and they were pretty horrific places. I've seen a massive change over the, over the last year where actually that has gone. There, there is not a security guard standing at the door, and you can get to speak to somebody, whereas previously it was almost impossible to actually get somebody to talk to. So... You know, and talking to your members, they, they've told me that, that, that it is much better and much more welcoming. Do you recognise that as a description, or do you feel that that's not the case? I would say if there's a job centre that you're aware of that you can walk into without a security guard being at the front door, I would like the name of it, please, because that would be in breach of the department's risk assessments with regard to this sort of thing. Don't get me wrong, right? There are many, many changes that we would like to make to job centres and to how le even legacy benefits were managed. But I would say that if there, there have been overall the changes to how the job centres have been run have been negative. They have been uh, deprived of the abilities that they had and the, the resources that they had to try and support people. And to give a very, very basic example, be the phones that we used to have for claimants to come in and use when they needed to, to come in and make calls to employers, to come in and make calls occasionally to our own uh, benefits side because they had queries about their payments and things like that. And the removal of that resource has, if you like, driven the problem underground. It, it moved the problem around. So people aren't coming to the job centre for that anymore. They're either not getting the help that they need or they're going to third sector organisations to ask for that kind of help. So don't get me wrong. I think you, you, your characterisation there of perhaps job centres have a changed atmosphere is not necessarily wrong, but I'm not sure that's for the best reasons. Right, OK. That's interesting. Thank you. OK. Hey, Mark Griffin. Thank, thanks, Kimina. Um, I wanted to come back to the, the role of uh, work coaches, and I wanted to put a, a quote to you from the Office of Budget Responsibility. They, they said that the DWP expects a lot of the modestly paid work coaches it's recruiting in terms of tailoring interventions to the needs of individuals and families in the context of local labour markets, setting conditions and monitoring compliance with them. Now, if the Office of Budget Responsibility are saying that the DWP are expecting a, a lot of work coaches, um, my view is probably that the DWP are, are expecting too much of the work coaches. Would you agree with that? And if you do, what would you say is the, the impact on claimants of the DWP expecting far too much of the work coaches? I would absolutely agree with the statement from the OBR that the DWP expects too much or expects an awful lot from modestly paid. I'd underline the modestly paid part of that uh, sentence as well because, you know, as you'll all be aware, the civil service as a whole has faced the, the, the most stringent pay freeze, I think, and pay uh, restraint of any area in the public sector. But in terms of the, uh, the impact on work coaches, yes, you look at other parts of the world and the, the way that they approach the job that our work coaches do. The, the job that you're talking about in other social security systems is a degree qualified job which is exceptionally well paid and which is about tailoring very, very individual support with access to a whole battery of additional training and learning for the claimants. That's simply not the case with regard to our work coaches. They have a, a very, very limited toolbox of things that they can do when, when it comes to uh, supporting claimants and, you know, I obviously speak from things that have happened currently. Uh, you know, I, I suspect that the things that happen currently are a good uh, marker of how things will happen in the future. But the emphasis has always been that where that limited toolbox falls short, 
then the problem isn't with the lack of provision from DWP, so DWP would say, but is with the claimants themselves, and therefore they must be, you know, appropriately referred to to sanctions. So yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that statement. Okay. So your view is then that because the DWP are, are expecting too much of the work coaches, that then that is leading to claimants being. Um, sanctioned unnecessarily, um, payments being missed, payments being incorrectly made, people being pushed into real hardship because the DWP are, are put too much onto their work coaches. Yes, and it's, it's not just the work coaches either. I mean, the hardship payments, the, the legacy benefits um, actually have a better response rate within 24 hours than universal credit. That's how you know, much extra pressure is being put on for people who come in for things, since you mentioned hardship, for things like hardship payments. So yes, the, the, the pressure is, is terrible. It's about workload to begin with, but it's also about you know, to what level are we expecting our work coaches to intervene in the lives of their claimants? To what degree can we or are we being prepared to trust claimants to, to you know, manage their own affairs? And it seems very much like the tendency is towards increased and more intrusive intervention than not. And that's a, that's a massive burden to put on work coaches who are, are not um, they're given, if you like, departmental training, and I think if you speak to any member of DWP staff, they'd tell you what they think of departmental training. But you're not talking about people who are um, professionally qualified the way that social workers are, for example, to intervene in the lives of their claimants. And we would absolutely want to see, if they're going to persist with this, much, much better training you know, accredited training, for example, and we don't mean by accredited training the kind of um, cut price apprenticeships, which they do occasionally try and roll out in DWP, but serious things that will help people to be able to support their claimants. Thanks. I, I did have a question about level of qualification, training and, and pay of work coaches, but I think you've covered that well already. Um, I wanted to move on to the level of discretion that work coaches um, have in whether you think that the discretion they have is, is being applied consistently. My own um, local unemployed worker centre have come to me with concerns that they have claimants turning up at, at their door, given different stories of different information and different um, conditions being put on seemingly very similar situations. I don't know what your view is on how consistently work coaches are, are, are applying that discretion. Well, I hear the same stories that you do. I mean, I work very closely, the union works very closely with the Disabled People Against Cuts and other organisations that represent our claimants. And they would be very upfront in telling the same kind of stories of inconsistency and about things depending very much on work, which work coach you talk to. Now, what I would say, though, is that you only ever hear maybe one side of any individual story. You'll hear perhaps the work coach saying, this is why I did that, or you'll hear the claimant saying, well, that's why it was unfair, but you never ever hear both. So I don't tend to make judgments about uh, you know, cases like that. What I would say is that if we are serious about a system that supports people, then the discretion should be in relation to what support to provide, not in relation to how can we take people's benefits off them. So it's not about whether or not certain, certain types of discretion are applied consistently. It's about, well, what power do we really want work coaches to have and what powers will enable them to do what they're actually there to do, which is to support claimants. And you know, that is what they want to be there to do. So that means giving them the power to, for example, since you mentioned discretion, vary the appointment times that they have. So to have half an hour with a claimant instead of 10 minutes with a claimant means additional work that they can do to overcome barriers to work, to overcome barriers to in-work progression. But it also means then that somewhere else you need to find the resource to deal with the people who aren't being seen by that work coach because they've not done three 10-minute appointments with three different people. They've done one half an hour appointment with somebody who really needed it. So questions of how we prioritise resource, how we allocate resource, and do we have enough resource have a huge impact on how and when that discretion is used and on the final experience of the people who are actually coming in to use that service. Thanks. Give me the last, last question I had was on your comments earlier about the switch from annual um, income assessment to monthly. Yeah. Now, that's causing real problems for people who are paid four weekly yeah. and are getting two payments in the month of December and are essentially losing all universal credit entitlement at, at Christmas time, basically. I wonder what your view is on that and if there are any solutions that you would suggest to DWP on that. 
Well, the, the view is obviously that it's terrible that people would lose benefit to which they should be entitled if you were to take an average view of their earnings rather than, as you say, that the four weekly period, which can potentially mean that two wage earning days fall within the same month which we use to calculate UC eligibility. So it, it seems to me that there'd be a very easy fix to that, to change the system of regarding those two as being within the same eligibility month and to smooth out the process, to smooth out the earnings. And to be fair, there's, there's plenty of precedent for that as well. In legacy benefits, decision makers on JSA and ESA, these are benefit processing staff, they're not frontline work coaches, they deal with decisions in the um, back of house areas. Some of their job would have been to look at earnings over a broader period and then to make a decision about, you know, is that commensurate with continuing entitlement to benefit? So we have done it before where we've not been quite so uh, short, uh, taken such a short view in terms of eligibility requirements. So why shouldn't we be able to do that with universal credit? Okay, thank you. Okay. Shula Robertson. Good morning. I wanted to go back to uh, a couple of things you mentioned. Uh, you talked about a bit of a recognition of the complexity of the managed migration of, of those on in work benefits and the delays. What's your understanding now of the time frame? Um, have, have you been in discussions about the revised time frame? What's your understanding of it? The first that the union was, I, I want to put this in air quotes, consulted about the time frame was whenever it was leaked to the press that mm -hmm. the time frame was being kicked back from uh, the beginning of 2019 to the middle of 2019 and that the end date was being pushed back to, I think it's the end of 2023 now. Mm -hmm. There have been no serious discussions with the representatives of staff over that process whatsoever. So essentially, it's, you've found out through the public domain that it might be a kind of six months, because it was originally supposed to be December, wasn't yeah, it? That, that's right. Okay. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to ask you about, and I, I accept this is a, a kind of policy decision, but the issue of transitional protection, and as I understand, there's regulations being drafted at the moment. So I guess the first question is, uh, have PCS been involved at all and consulted around what those transitional protections should look like in order, because obviously the principle being that people who are migrating across their income would be protected. So have PCS been in consulted? No, not at all. And I think the stark contrast is with the approach of the Scottish ministers to the uh, regulations that are laid on the new social security agency, uh, where would they have been very open in offering us consultation at a policy level about what we think those regulations should and shouldn't contain compared to the approach of the Westminster government when it comes to this very question? There's been no consultation on that whatsoever. So uh, there's uh, been a couple of concerns um, raised in evidence so far, and I'm particularly concerned what those transitional protection regulations may look like. So, for example, uh, if you, you know, if you think about a, a woman who may be in an abusive relationship and uh, is concerned of a change of circumstances to those transitional protection, that she may lose the transitional protection if she leaves that abusive relationship. Does PCS share concerns about um, you know, that, that type of scenario? And would you be making representations around that in terms of trying to influence the, the regulations? I think it's fair to say that the union doesn't want a single person to lose a single penny of their benefit as a result of being forced to move from working tax credits to, um, the, to universal credit. And we don't think that in situations like that, it would necessarily be helpful to, to cause, to, for any, any uh, change of circumstances to involve such a, a major change to somebody's benefit. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, we share all of the concerns that have been raised in relation to a lot of these transitional protections and how far they apply and, do, and, and the kinds of changes of circumstances that will result in the end of the transitional protections. Absolutely. We have put stuff in the public domain on that one. We are working to, to prepare additional submissions to uh, UC management, but also to, to um, the Secretary of State. And I know that that we have been working as well with the Shadow Secretary of State in relation to their concerns about universal credit. It would be really helpful if any of those are for public consumption that could be shared with the committee yeah, as we go more forward. More than happy to do that. Okay, Chairman uh, Balfour. Uh, thank you, Camilla, uh, and good morning. Um, the advantage of going almost last, I suspect, is that most of the questions have been dealt with. But, but I do want to come back to just one issue. I, I mean, I think. I have, because of the controversy around it, gone out my way to visit a number of job centres within my region. 
and had really helpful discussions, um, both with GWP, but also with a lot of your members. I, I mean, I have to say, we got the, I got the opportunity on, I think, three or four occasions at different places to walk and to speak to your members um, without anyone else listening. And what they have reported to me is very different from what you have said to me this morning. They have been a lot more positive. They've been um, welcoming many of the um, discretions that we've been given. They, they feel they've had the training. They feel they've got the support. Um, and so clearly you are trying to represent what your members are saying. And of course, mine is only a small cross-section of that. But I wonder how, how am I getting such a much more different take from your members on the ground than what you're seeing today? I honestly wouldn't like to hazard a guess at why it is that people have said different things to you than what they have said to our reps up and down the country. And, you know, the, the thing that you have to remember is that it's not just me coming here having spoken to members at one job centre or even members at half a dozen job centres. The view of the union is shaped by the reps who are elected by the members of every single job centre in the country and the reports that they deliver on a regular basis to the elected executive of the union and the the policy that is passed as a result of their views at the union's annual conference. So it may be that the individuals that you've spoken to had the views that you describe. It may be that, um, as I mean, this is this is a conversation that I do occasionally have with management in DWP, where a manager will say, "Well, I spoke to staff just the other day, and they said everything's fine," and the same staff are out in the car park the following week protesting about the the state of affairs. I think that's just one of those things. In regards to reports that you're getting back from your local representation, oh. is anything positive coming back? Clearly, are they given? Um, any comments from the members who maybe do have positive comments? Is that reflected in any of the reports, or is it simply negativity that's coming back? I don't think it would be fair to say that everything that we ever receive is negative. Um, I mean, the last time that we did a, a big survey of members in DWP, uh, I think it, it resulted in about 500 people um, commenting in the survey and, and voting on the different options in the survey. Now, the vast majority were negative. But yes, there were people who thought positive things were happening as a result of UC and the kinds of things that you mentioned about discretion and so forth. You know, I'm, I'm sure that there are people that have those views, but I think they are very much the minority. OK, thank you, Kevin. Can I just check on a, a, a couple of things, yeah. Mr Simple? Is, is the PCS position or your position that tax credits should not be part of universal credit, it should remain a standalone um, benefit or entitlement rather than benefit as opposed to being part of universal credit. Would that be the position? I don't think it, it would be fair to say that we have a particular position as you've laid it out. The, the, you have to remember that the uh, amounts being allocated for different people who move across universal credit are in some cases better. That some people get more money under universal credit than they will get under the, the legacy benefit under tax credits. And obviously we want people to have as much money as possible. So it's not a straightforward question to say, mm -hmm. do you think tax credits should just exist as it is? Or do you think things should move to universal credit? Because in a sense, we want elements of both. We, we do want um, people to have the, the increased allowances uh, where those are applicable, but also then we don't want people to, to, the, to be submitted to the kind of cuts that are going to be implemented for, for a lot of people under universal credit. So we do want elements of both systems. We want the rollout currently halted mm. to allow time to actually sit down and puzzle through who's going to be better off who's not going to be better off? How do we make sure that they are not losing anything? How do we make sure that nobody loses a single penny? Regardless of what a benefit is called, it's about what purpose it serves and about how much money people who need it are getting. And we want to maximise that, regardless of what we call the system. OK, I think, I think that, that's very clear. Can I, can I also ask for clarity in terms of those uh, who will be in universal credit uh, with in what potentially in what conditionality or potential sanctions. So mm -hmm. that conversation we were having about uh, can you increase your hours, can you get yeah. a higher hourly rate, and if you don't do that potentially, we, we could be taking money off you. Um, I think you were very clear that with the right, if the PCA staff, if the workforce get the right support and there's enough of them, then you can give good quality support uh, to, to, to individuals. Um, but do you believe sanctioning should exist at all in relation to 
in work claimants? Do you think the fact that sanction sits there at all potentially puts an area of conflict into the support that your members can offer those that want work progression? So what is the PCS position in relation to sanctions specific to uh, in-work entitlements under universal credit? Our view of sanctions, and I don't limit it to just in-work sanctions, is that sanctions are ineffective and should be abolished. And that applies equally to in-work um, potential for conditionality for sanctions. We are very, very clear that sanctions are a very blunt instrument which do not have the effect that the government believes that they do of encouraging people to apply for jobs and so forth. All they do is cause additional barriers to finding work for the unemployed. And all they will do if they are applied to those people who are in work, who have a job, is create additional barriers for them in terms of the kind of progression that we actually want. Yeah, and, it will, and it will destroy relationships between Very much so. coaches. Uh, Alison Jones, I'll take in a little second. I just want to acknowledge that I've spotted you there. You, you mentioned the, the halting the rollout of universal credit, and you said until we work out hmm. how this can be done effectively. So are, are we trying to work it out currently? In other words, is the UK government or DWP put, putting back, putting back... Um, Full, full rollout of this and still not really sure how to make it work. And by we, do you mean the PCS could assist the DWP in finding solutions to all the issues thrown up by Universal Credit? And have you been afforded that opportunity? Whenever I say we, just for absolute clarity, I'm always referring to the PCS and the workers in DWP as represented by my union. I wouldn't presume to speak for the department. The, we have not been afforded any kind of opportunity to be involved in what would be called up here the co-production of the uh, of universal credit, and it would be we we would we would like to be obviously, but we are ourselves going to be working on proposals to really really iron out a lot of the problems that people are facing. But is that a, a very clear offer to the DWP then? Hold all of this now, and PCS will sit down with the UK government and find a way of making this work that doesn't uh, put undue pressure on staff and have detriment to the, the, the public that you serve? Yes. OK, I think that's pretty clear. Alison Johnson. Yeah, can I just um, a bit of clarity on managed migration? Um, you've expressed concerns about the so-called managed migration, and key amongst those is the transition may not proceed automatically, um, that claimants will be written to, and then they will have to get in touch with the DWP to... Yeah. I mean, what would happen if a letter gets lost or a claimant simply can't understand for whatever reason what is being asked? They'll just end up with no money whatsoever. These are things that we don't have an answer to and that obviously we are very concerned about. But not only that, I mean, we're also concerned about if we're writing to people to tell them they have to apply for the new benefit and during the application process they have changed address or something like that, will that count as a change of circumstances that removes their transitional protections? You know, the... I think it was the, the Alex Sharma at the, the Work and Pensions Committee who, who said that, well, we're not just talking about the period of a month, we'll run it over a longer period of time. Well, how long is a longer period of time and what are you doing to get in contact with these people? It used to be the case that we would have had uh, what would have been called pensions local services, now DWP visiting, that we could have actually sent out to meet with people, to, to really chase this up, to make sure that people were, were, were making that transition. The resources available to those teams have been cut to the bone, so we don't have that kind of uh, availability to, to do that anymore. But you know, what resources being put in to make sure no one falls through the cracks? Somewhere in the programme responsible for universal credit, they will have worked out what percentage of people they think will not make the transition. And that information hasn't been shared with us, but I, I have seen it for other uh, changes to legacy benefits from back in the day, you know, whenever we've had uh, consultations in the past. I can't imagine it doesn't exist for universal credit, and I'd be very interested to see what percentage of people they already estimate will fall through the cracks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Polly McNeil. Well, it's just on the same subject. I, I think it's going to be a real shock I only realised this a few days ago that so, so those who have been in receipt of tax credits will have to make a fresh application. This is utterly shocking. So 
You can have someone who has been working full out, 35 hours with three children, getting tax credits, doing, their, doing what they're supposed to do, working hard and actually having a better standard of living because of the tax credits. I, I would say that figure is going to be pretty high because they're, if I'm unaware, then almost certainly people out there are unaware that they get a letter, they will not understand it. They won't understand why they're getting a letter saying, oh, see, they, 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 because arguably someone may have been in receipt of tax credits for 10 years easily. No, no, actually, that's not true. From whenever they were introduced, would that be 2011, something like that? So, right, so that would be. But that's a long time to have been in receipt of those. And a letter comes through the post, oh, by the way, you now have to make a fresh claim to the DWP, which you've had no relationship with up to that point. This is a disaster, a total disaster for those people. I, I expect you would agree with that. I, I absolutely would. And then you get into questions about, well, what phone number are we putting on that letter to deal with the millions of phone calls that we're going to get oh. as a result of panicked people facing the end of their tax credits claim? It might be worth just exploring that a, a little bit further, because what we haven't really spoken about is the more generic fact <coughs> that universal credit is designed to have, at the very least, a five-week time lag before anyone receives any cash at all that they're entitled to, one-week processing, four-week four, four week, uh, lag time, and that's if everything goes goes to schedule. We know examples of eight or nine weeks that, that some, some individuals have been waiting. Will that five-week gap without funds also exist for those transferring or those having to reapply from the tax credit system? Yeah. into universal credit, will they be part of that five-week gap also, do you know, Mr Semple? I can't answer that question because the draft regulations I don't think are being laid until next week and then we'll really get to see what the process is that they're planning for a lot of this. But I, I, I mean, if you were asking for me to make a best guess, I can't imagine there will be a five-week lag for, before eligibility kicks in for the new system. I imagine that what they would try and do is make sure that it runs one into the other. Right. So, so that, that, that may be expressing an awful lot of confidence in DWP, uh, bearing in mind. But, 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 but where we can get clarity is yeah. the PCS position should be, it, 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 this should not happen at all until it can happen seamlessly and yes. there should be no, no gap at all. That's absolutely right. Okay, yes. that, that's pretty clear. We've got a bit of time left and I can ask questions all day, but we've got lots of members of this committee. Shona Robinson. Just, just further on, again, you might not be able to answer this because of the l lack of sight of the regulations, but... <clears throat> I'm just wondering if, um, well, first of all, whether, and this is something we should probably ask the DWP, is around whether or not they have built in that percentage of people who you say fall through the cracks, but that they assume will not apply, um, and whether that's built into their, their budgets, which will be interesting to know. But if someone does fall through the cracks and then eventually makes a retrospective application, would your understanding be that it would be backdated to the point at which they leave tax credits or is there the potential I don't know what common practice has been I guess there's been nothing completely um, identical to this so it might be new territory what would your expectation be um, if someone six months down the line realises that you know they're going to have to make an application um, what would your understanding be? My understanding is is the same as yours, which is I don't know the answer to the question just yet. But what I would say is obviously we'd want to make sure that as many people could make um, retrospective claims as possible if that becomes uh, necessary. Standard practice, since you ask about that, for legacy benefits, for example, is that you generally have um, up to three months wherein you can backdate a claim from the date that you claimed it. And, you know, that, that seemed reasonable for legacy benefits, but with a, a change of this magnitude, with a lot of the concerns that people will have around universal credit, I think it would probably be reasonable to go in excess of that. And do you know whether there's going to be a, a dedicated unit established to deal with all the inquiries that people will make? I mean, the way, you know, you're talking about the volume of phone calls as people realise when they get those letters that Pauline McNeil was referring to. I mean, is PCS understanding that there will be a kind of dedicated <coughs> team to deal with that? Or what's your understanding? The, at the minute, uh, UC telephony is managed through something called integrated telephony, and this involves geographical call routing. What happens is whenever you make a claim and give us your telephone number, essentially we're able to allocate you to a work 
to, to a, a case manager within the processing side of DWP. Whenever you make a call from that number, the phones automatically allocate you to the phone of your designated case manager. So you're meant to be having a, a personal relationship with someone who regularly picks up your calls. Now, it doesn't work, um, you know, perfectly or, well, at all at the minute, really. But the... So what, what happens after that is if you can't reach your case manager, you wind up taking the call goes out to their team. If you can't reach their team, it goes out to the whole service centre. If you can't, uh, if it can't go to the whole service centre because they're all on phone calls, then it goes to a national telephony hub. The, the impact of the kind of calls that you're talking about is unquantified at this stage. They've not given us figures for how many calls that they actually estimate will be taken. Mm -hmm. I imagine I mean, the, the, the discussion that um, has been had so far is that the rollout will be very limited up until 2020, and then we'll move at pace. This was the same kind of conversation that we had whenever UC Full Service began to roll out and took over from what was the predecessor UC Live Service. But the, the rollout at pace for Universal Credit Full Service was a catastrophe. It resulted in any number, I mean, the, the kinds of delays to claims and so on that uh, Mr. Doris outlined there was the, the common experience during the UC full service rollout and the, the genuine anger of the staff that they didn't have the wherewithal, the time to help the people who were calling in in such desperate state of affairs what was a, a sight to see. The, we, we have no reason to believe that the impact of managed migration will be anything shy of exactly the same kind of thing that happened during the rollout of UC full service. And as far as you're aware, do you know if any recipients of tax credits have been contacted in any way to alert them to what's happening over there, what, what was going to be happening in December until the delay? Are you aware of any contact being made? I'm not aware of any, no. Right. Okay. Michelle Valentine. I just, uh, am I, I correct in saying you represent two thirds of DWP staff approximately? Is, is, is that correct? That's round about right, yeah. Yeah. And, and of the 12,000 that are currently um, servicing universal credit, would that percentage be about the same? Probably a bit higher. We tend to have higher density in um, you know, sites like universal credit service centres. Right. And when you talked about your last survey, you said you had 500 responses. Mm. Would that be a kind of normal level of response that you would get from your surveys? Yeah, I mean, we would do a, a survey amongst different groups of members on a, on a relatively regular basis, and we'd have, you know, a, a substantial number, usually middle to high three figures, responding to those. Because, right. I mean, you talk about the, the level of concern hmm. and, and the outcry, and I'm wondering why, if, if, if it's so high, you aren't getting a much higher sort of response to a survey, why they don't want you to, you know, know that? I don't think it's that they don't want us to know it. I think it's that people are already very busy. So to be using, you know, their 15 minute break to respond to a union survey as opposed to, you know, have an actual break, um, it, it's not, doesn't occur to everybody to do that. What I can tell you is that whenever we held the car park meetings at Walsall and Wolverhampton, well in excess of 50% of the staff of both of those sites turned out to the car park meeting and took a unanimous vote in favour of industrial action on the basis of the concerns that I've outlined to you today. So I'm in no doubt whatsoever about the mandate I have from members to speak up for the concerns that we've been talking about. Right. So do you expect to, to be going on strike in the near future? I honestly can't comment that DWP have agreed to urgent negotiations on Monday and we'll go from there. Okay, thank you. Can I maybe, um, well, I certainly hope that um, those negotiations will be real, relevant and productive and the, 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 the threat of industrial action is lifted, but I, I appreciate the frustration that your members must be, must be feeling. You've been clear today that there's been around 30,000 less jobs over the last decade or so in, 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 in the service at a time where staff have been asked to do much, much more. And you, you've, you've put those concerns pretty clearly on the record today. You've also, you've also said that you believe that the service has to be, I'm paraphrasing, I hope I'm capturing this accurately, has to be more public facing in the communities and you kind of compared that to the rollout of the new Scottish Social Security Agency where they're, they're trying to get a mix of communication with um, um, claimants. Uh, yeah, for some it will be telephone, for some it will be face to face and some it will be digital and I was just having a look there at some of the information in relation to the Scottish Social Security Agency and they've got a 
a pledge to hopefully have a hub in every community making use of existing yeah. public buildings. So I suppose this is the nub of my question. If there was to be more staff uh, in DWP to support universal credit and to support work road, would you want to see them go into the job centres that are left and just do more of the same and ease that workload? Or do you think there's a need for a significant service redesign? Because we're talking about digital by default for claimants. You know, laptops exist, broadband exists. Uh, the idea of co-located hubs at the heart of communities where uh, work coach teams can go in for parts of the week and support constructively um, some of those claimants might be a service. There's one version of a service redesign model which might mirror some of the work the Scottish Social Security Agency is going to do. So, PCS, you don't like what's happening quite clearly. You think staff are overworked, they need better support, it's impacting on claimants. But is giving more people to do the same really the answer? Or do you think there might be the need for a more sig significant service redesign? The members at our conference have repeatedly expressed concerns about concepts that you outlined there, like co-location and the impact to um, you know the kinds of services that we deliver. Uh, the, 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 the job centres that we have are a process of battles over many years to ensure that we have, for example, you know, space, that the, the, they're spacious the, to, to be able to deal with what are fairly confidential conversations sometimes with people without the person next to them overhearing them and things like that. So they're, they're built to a certain specification. Now, are they perfect? No. But I think as, as the first step, we want the staff in them to be able to deliver the support that, that we th feel is necessary, and that means having many, many additional staff. So as a first step, I think is the additional staff are the key thing, and from there, we can begin to design what do we actually want a, a wholly revised social security system to look like. I think it would also be fair to say that members in DWP up and down the country do believe that the social security system needs to be overhauled in a, in a big way. And I don't think that we would impose too many preconditions on that, but the basic preconditions would be that you defend the terms and conditions of the staff, that you defend the things that the, the claimants find to be beneficial, you defend a quality service, a quality public service, I would add. And you know, one of the, the problems with co-location is that you're often talking about co-locating with private sector organisations who are, you know, not to put it bluntly or anything, but wind up bidding for work from DWP, work that is then taken away from existing DWP staff, and to which work which they don't, private companies don't deliver to the same standard as the, the uh, civil servants in DWP do. Mm. So I, I certainly take on board those concerns. I have to say, just, I suppose just for the record, in case I sit here running with that, that question, I was thinking about skills development Scotland, citizens' advice, those kind of yeah. uh, public sector and third sector or organisations, but I think you've been pretty clear about um, the terms and conditions of the people that you represent and that any overhaul of a service would have to protect those at the outset. I think that's, that's pretty clear. Are there any other uh, questions from from MSPs? Can I thank you very much? Actually, before I thank you very much, and I will do that, is there anything that you'd like to put on the record today before we move on to the next item on the agenda that you don't feel you've the chance to, to, to express here this morning? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to make a final comment, Convener. I, I think that We've covered most of the points that I came here to make, the, the key themes being the undervaluation of the work coaches, the key themes being the potential for uh, the inflicting of sanctions upon those people who are going to be in receipt of in-work universal credit, the impact of anything other than a light touch regime. But I think that the thing that I really want to underscore for the committee is the, the problems with staffing that at the root of all of the conversations that we are having, as well as being poorly prepared with bad policies implemented from above, we do not have the staff that we need to deliver the quality service that every single member of staff of DWP desperately wants to be able to deliver. And if we were given that staff, you would begin to see a significant and substantial change to the public perception of the benefit system, particularly if that was allied to the elimination of the sanctions regime. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Semple, and uh, thank you for your time. So that, that concludes Agenda Item 4.
on public for agenda item five. Yeah. Um, so we now move to agenda item five, the Scottish Government consultation on the investigation of offences, regulations and code of practice for investigations. And can I refer to paper three? which is a note by the clerk. And the committee sought written reviews to inform any response it might make to the Scottish Government's consultation on the investigation of offences, regulations and code of practice for investigations. Uh, the committee's only response was from Inclusion Scotland, who will be responding directly to the Scottish Government's consultation. Is the committee content to note the points raised by Inclusion Scotland? Yes. Okay. Just um, of course. come in there. I mean, Inclusion Scotland have said um, we believe that this would make it impossible, that's impossible for third sector agencies and their employees who provide services to their clients on a confidential basis to continue to offer such services on that basis in the future. I mean, I appreciate that Inclusion Scotland will be responding directly to the Scottish Government's consultation. Um, but I, I, I probably would be grateful if the committee would consider writing to the minister to note that this is a response they should be expecting. Because I think Inclusion Scotland, you know, they represent a great many people who, and they clearly have some concern about this. That would appear to be a fairly reasonable suggestion. I would think I'm looking at members. I, I don't see anyone d disagree to that. And thank you for putting that on the, re the record, Alison. Okay. That's helpful. Thank so you. on that basis, are, are we content with the approach as outlined? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now move to agenda item six, which is petition PE1677, calling on the Scottish Government to make more money available to mitigate the welfare cuts. And can I refer members to paper five and a petition by Dr Sarah Glynn. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to make more money available to mitigate the impact of UK government welfare cuts through uh, reassessing spending priorities and bringing in more progressive taxation. Um, in light of the evidence taken by this committee previously, the correspondence from the Scottish Government in response to the Public Petitions Committee and that the Scottish Social Security Scotland Act 2018 makes provision for new forms of assistance and uprating, uh, the committee is invited to close the petition. But before we make that, that decision, if we did close the petition in doing so, we may wish to acknowledge that, firstly, Policy and expenditure considerations such as those raised in the petition are embedded in the work of this committee. In other words, I suppose that's to give confidence to the petitioner that this is the day-to-day -day work of scrutiny of this committee anyway. And secondly, the committee will shortly consider a pre-budget letter to the Cabinet Secretary. This provides an opportunity, should we wish to, for the committee to raise any of the petitioner's concerns in the context of the forthcoming Scottish Budget 2019-2020. So with, with those assurances, I suppose, to the, to the petitioner, uh, I'll, I'll take any comments before I invite you to agree to close the petition. Are there any comments? Mark Griffin. Thanks, Camina. I think we are slightly premature in um, proposing to close the, the petition, particularly given the points that you've just made that were yet to consider and agree the letter that we then send to the, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think it would be worthwhile waiting at the very least until we have um, agreed what the contents of that letter would be. And actually, ideally, um, wait until we hear from the Cabinet Secretary um, and give an oral evidence as we go through the budget process. Okay, are there any other, other views, Shona Robinson? Um, I mean, do Dr. Glenn has uh, spoken to me on a number of occasions about these issues and, and other issues. Um, I mean, I, I uh, have some sympathy for, I guess, a process issue, a timing issue here mm -hmm. that, um, you know, if it was helpful to come back to looking at the petition in the light of the discussions about the budget, um, then there may be a logical order. I not, not, kind of don't have strong views either way, particularly, but um, I think the, what Dr Glenn appears to be asking for, and certainly did in our meeting with me, was for particularly the, um, the, the welfare fund to be uh, expanded. And obviously that's a matter that we're going to come on to discuss in the budget mm -hmm. uh, later. Of course. Uh, Alison Johnson? As the lead committee on this issue, it would be, in my view, I think there is an issue of timing here. I mean, there are obviously Dr Glynn represents a strong coalition of um, 
of those who want to ensure that we are doing all we can as a parliament to to make sure that, that, that people's lives are worth living. And I would like us to wait until we've discussed the letter, perhaps heard from the Cabinet Secretary, and that matters have progressed so that the petitioners do feel that the Scottish Parliament has urged the Scottish Government to do all that it can. Okay. I don't see anyone particularly saying they would disagree with, with that approach. I think we, we, hold, we hold it open until we've, we've progressed our, our own budget scrutiny approach a, a bit further. It might be worth putting on the record, though, that... Um, I, would, I would think this committee, one of the things we will look at in their business day-to-day, week-to-week, will be that connectivity between the UK social security system, the Scottish social security system, protections that are in place and how it impacts people on the ground. And the reassurance, whenever we do finally close this petition, that I think we want to give the petitioner is that the point has been clearly made, it's not lost on us, and it will be part of our week-to-week -week work. And it, it won't take a petition in the future to have that embedded into the working practices of the committee. So if the issue is in relation to the timing of when we close the petition, let's just uh, carry on a bit further. If we're all agreed to do that, so we'll keep it open at the moment. Yep. yep. OK. Uh, so we now move to agenda item seven, uh, social security. And, and Yep, absolutely, as, as I was about to say. And we've previously agreed to take that item in private. We're now moving to private session.